Hi kids, it's Mrs. Freeville. How are you? Thanks, I'm fine too. Good. Hope you're doing well. Um, as we continue on through the year of COVID. Um, so this is video presentation uh, for today's class in marine biology, uh, Monday, December Blurba's Day. I don't know. It's December 7th. Uh, and this is what uh, we did in class today. I'm sorry the video is a little late. I tried to record the actual live class. My technology skills are still not up to par for that, but so I will do this really quickly. Uh, today is the last day of the Sandy Shore Ecosystem Unit. Uh, Wednesday, the next class time will be the test for this unit, and I will have instructions on, on that at the end of this presentation. So let's talk about some other things that live at the beach. The last few things um, that are some of my favorite, favorite animals. I say that about everything. I said that in class today. I say that about everything, like everything's my favorite, and it, it's true. I, I love all of the creatures uh, in the ocean, most of the creatures on land. Um, so let's talk about let's talk about some of these that I nerd out about on a regular. So uh, we talked a little bit about shorebirds last week when we talked about the food web of the sandy shores. We talked about a particular type of shorebird um, called a sanderling. And uh, so I just wanted to talk a little bit more about how important these guys are and what, what else they eat besides mole crabs. Um, there are uh, many different types of shorebird and they are a particular family of birds um, that have particular body styles um, that include long legs, long thin bills, uh, many of them have really long toes then and their feet aren't webbed. So these aren't swimming birds, these are wading birds and they generally um, spend their time eating on the shore of a body of water. In the ocean, we also have freshwater uh, plovers that will do some of this as well. In fact, we have a pair of them that nest in the soccer field uh, that, that visit the little the little creek that runs through Draper. Um, those little kill deer, little plovers, um, I, I sometimes hear them in the mornings. Uh, so they'll go along and what shorebirds in general do is they have that long beak, that long bill, and they will poke it down into the sand to eat invertebrates that are under the sand, whether it's little crustaceans like mole crabs or amphipods, or sometimes mollusks, which I'll talk about in a sec. Um, there are a few of them that don't have that long beak and, and their existence on the shore is a little bit different. They actually use their little beak to turn things over and catch the bugs underneath the underneath stones, underneath underneath leaves, underneath the rack line. Okay, so these guys are kind of uh, a mid-level important consumer in all of the beach ecosystems. Okay? And they're super cute. Oh my gosh! Uh, if if you Google some of these, you'll you and you like birds, you'll not be sorry. Um, especially jacanas. Gotta go look at their toes. They're crazy, crazy. We have avocets here in Utah. We have sandpipers here in Utah. Uh, we have a few stilts. If you go to the right places, you'll generally see them around all of our bodies of water. Okay? And of course, on the beach at the ocean. What are they eating besides those little mole crabs that you guys studied last week? Let me get out of the way somewhere. Okay. Uh, these guys eat a lot of mollusks that are in the um, substrate in the sand on a beach. So mollusks, let's talk about them for a minute because Fravel has a ridiculously large shell collection. And when you collect shells from a beach, first of all, always make sure that that is legally allowed where you are. Number two, make sure there's nothing alive left in the shell. Sometimes there will be an animal still in the shell. It just might be kind of tucked up inside of it. I forgot to grab shells. Hold please, I will be right back. Boy howdy, nothing like being prepared for for what I'm doing after school. <laughs> Class just got out. Okay, so uh, a little bit about mollusks. So mollusks are an animal, it's a phylum of animals that are in the invertebrate category in Kingdom Animalia. And invertebrates are animals without backbones, so mollusks are invertebrate, soft-bodied, non-segmented animals that um, have a shell surrounding their soft body. And they build that shell made of calcium carbonate, and it's secreted from a layer of tissue that's around their soft body. So it's like the mantle's almost kind of like their skin. The mantle layer is their skin and on the internal surface that is what protects all of their internal organs all of their viscera their guts the outside of that mantle layer 
they secrete calcium carbonate shells. Okay? And there's a couple of different, there's actually five different classes of mollusks. Um, I'm just going to talk about two of them, the, the, the more um, common shell builders of the shells that you might find on a beach and that are being eaten by shorebirds and other uh, small predators on a beach. So um, there are, and they also all have this structure called a siphon, which is uh, a tube that they will, that comes off of their body, that they stick out of their shell, and they use that tube, it's like a funnel, so that they suck in water and uh, release water through it. Um, bivalves have two, gastropods have one. It's like their little, it's like their breathing tube and their food tube, if you will, um, especially for bivalves. Okay, so class bivalvia or a bivalve mollusk. These are clams, oysters, and mussels. Okay, so this is an example of a clam. It, this one in, in the wild is not actually this golden color. This is this is a courtesy of, of one of my favorite nephews uh, who lives in Maine and found this wonderful this wonderful Venus clam and he painted it for me. But with bivalves, so they have two whoa two valves, two shells that when the animal is alive are hinged together at a hinge joint right there. And uh, the hinge is only held together by a ligament. Um, and they also kind of latch together in some species. They'll have little almost like look like teeth in their hinge and those kind of lock together. But generally once the animal dies and the soft body decomposes, what's left behind and what you mostly find on a beach is just one side of a shell. If you find a whole one, that's pretty important. But again, check to make sure it's not full of anything. And if you ever find one that's all the way open with a soft body in it, it's dead. Because when they're alive, they keep themselves very tightly closed and they'll only open enough to stick out their little siphons to breathe and eat and also to stick out their foot which is how they move so clams are burrowing animals they have uh, this muscular foot that will come out and they'll dig themselves down into the sand and so when you're walking on a beach if you're walking in the splash zone or in the swash zone and a wave comes in and then a wave goes out and you see all the bubbles coming up through the sand, that's because there are hundreds or thousands of animals that live under that sand. And a lot of times those little bubble burrows are created by clams that have, uh, as the wave came in, they filled their siphon with water, swashed it across their body inside. And uh, then as the wave goes out, they are furiously trying to dig down deeper again so that they can hide. And if you watch the shorebirds, the shorebirds will follow that wave out, poking their beaks into the sand where they see the bubbles trying to catch them. If you saw, uh, there's a Pixar short called, I think it's called Piper, about a little little bird, and, and he gets to see this happen. So um, that, that's actually true, pretty much how it happens. Okay? So again, bivalves are clams, which are burrowing oysters which are sessile and mussels as well so they attach to a substrate they usually attach to a rock they're more common in rocky shore uh, ecosystems and they they attach to a rock they never move you usually see them in huge colonies like growing over each other and then there's one that i forgot to list there called a scallop scallops come in a lot of different species and uh scallops look like clams but they've got these little ears on each side of the the umbro of their shell which is where the hinge is and scallops are actually free swimming free swimming bivalves. They will sit on the bottom of the ocean and when you startle them or if they decide it's time to move, they can actually uh, create a current by going and scooting through the water um, to get away from danger or to go toward food. And they have um, really interesting blue eyes. They're very cool animals. Okay? So those are bivalves. The other class is gastropoda and gastropods are single shelled and their shells uh, are a spiral shell okay um, and these include snails abalone sea, sea slugs and nudibranchs as well which are shell less or they have a very uh, minimal shell um, so with snails you get this 
a uh, beautiful coiled shell. They come in all shapes and sizes. This is a queen conch from the Caribbean. Um, and the, the soft body sits inside of this opening. So this opening is called the aperture and the soft body comes out and they move on top of a muscular foot. So the clams have the burrowing foot. These guys have this foot that moves with muscular waves. If you've ever watched a garden snail move, they're crawling on their foot. You know what a snail is, right? So this was a giant snail. And this little divot at the top is where their siphon comes out and they use that to breathe and then they have a separate mouth, head, eyes, tentacles on their face. Um, the biggest part of the shell um, around the opening, that's called the body whorl. And as they build their shells, when they are born as teensy tiny little larvae, and they do go through metamorphosis, they are as big as the apex of their shell. So when you look at the spiral on a seashell, on a gastropod shell, the very tip is how small it was when it was born or hatched. And as they grow, they add spirals, they add whorls to their body, and their body is still contained inside the biggest whorl. That's called the body whorl at the bottom. Um, and there's all different sh shapes and sizes. This is a um, murex shell. Okay. And um, they, they're also really tiny ones. I forgot to grab one. Sorry. Uh, the really tiny like dove shells. Uh, and there's also tiny, tiny bivalves called wedge clams. And those guys live in the shallow sand around a sandy shore. And those are those little guys that though that the shorebirds are mostly eating okay so again when you find a shell on the shore it used to have an animal in it it used to have the soft bodied mollusk in it and if you collect shells i told you the rules don't break them also don't buy shells from craft stores because those aren't supplied by people picking up dead shells on the beach those are dredged live animals that have been ripped out of the ocean by a net or a chain link fence being dragged behind a boat. They are laid out in the sun to die slowly. They are cleaned, packaged, and sold in plastic. So don't buy craft store shells, okay? Okay, so, uh, in the, so these are bivalves, and if you have any shells at home, feel free to go grab them. I'll wait so you can uh, take a look at them and know what you're looking at. Go ahead. Okay, back, okay. So in bivalve shells, they have specific anatomies. So the very tip, of the shell at the top part uh, that is called the umbo and again this is this is where they start their life as this tiny little clam okay and on the um on the outside of the shell you can see they'll have growth lines here so uh this is the dorsal surface ventral surface okay um and i never remember posterior and anterior one is I want to say this is posterior and this is anterior. I should know that, but I don't. Um, so you can actually count their growth lines and you can kind of guesstimate how old they are in years or seasons, depending on the species. And then if you look on the inside of a shell, if you have one that isn't polished, I don't know if you can even see this, but you might see some marks on the inside of the shell that are scars. And that's where their soft body used to attach to their shell inside. When there's a line across this area, that's the mantle scar. That's where their soft body stopped. And then um, you might see two big areas, two big scars. That is where their adductor muscles attached. And that's what keeps them closed up tightly, keeps them safe when they are alive. Okay. <clears throat> Again, oh, this is the hinge where the two shells join together and there are ligaments and sometimes hinge teeth that sit in there. Uh, yeah, okay. <clears throat> excuse me. Um, and then here's just some examples of some bivalves. So this is one of the scallops that I showed you, Doo -doo -doo. just sitting in some seagrass, waiting to be scared so it can go whoop, 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 and swim away. And you can see in this one, those beautiful blue dots, those are its eyes. It can have hundreds of eyes. This is a tridacna clam. That's a giant clam. And they are the largest of the bivalves. And they, they live for hundreds of years and get super massive, beautiful animals. Um, this is a wedge clam. And they are the tiny guys that live in the sand on the beach just under your feet. Sometimes you can see them um, if you, if, 
if there are any intertidal pools on a sandy shore, you might be able to see those guys uh, hanging out in there. And then these are the clams that we kind of like to eat. So those are about this, this big to this big. Things like uh, uh, quaggas and little neck clams. Um, those also uh, hang out in the sand and burrow down. And then the gastropods, the snail shells, again, they have anatomies to their shells. So uh, this is the apex. The whole top part of it that has all of those whorls are the spire. There are sutures between each spire, which is where uh, their body continues to, or it's where the new whorl attaches as they grow. Um, and then, so this whole thing is a spire. And then we have the body whorl, that's the biggest part. The opening is the aperture, okay? And then the columnella, this one doesn't have a great columnella, does that? That eh, kind of does right there. And some of them will have little rough parts, little teethy parts. Um, and when they are threatened, they can withdraw into their body, into withdraw their soft body into their shell. And some of them even have a little door, a little shell door that hinges shut on them. And when their body is out, it kind of hinges up out of the way so that they can crawl. And that door is called an operculum. Okay. All right. So that's the anatomies of a snail shell. And here are some examples of some snails. This is a moon snail and their bodies, their feet are huge. Uh, that, that shell is probably about this big. Um, this is, I believe, a helmet snail and they have a really uh, long and thin opening. And uh, this, I believe, is a dove snail. If there are any marine biologists that are watching this and shaking their heads at my bad identification of that animal, please let me know. <laughs> Okay, why am I making you know all the shell anatomies? Because I want you to do a quick lab. Um, you can do this now or you can do this at the end. Feel free to pause me. But if you have seashells at home, go grab them. And I want you to investigate them. Choose three gastropod shells, three bivalve shells. If you don't have shells at home, feel free to Google image bivalve shells and gastropod shells. I want you to draw them. And then on Canvas, there is a picture of those, uh, those two those two um, illustrations that have the labeled anatomies, I want you to uh, label your own shells, okay? Okay, and if you are coming back to school in the next week, you can always come into my classroom and use my shells, okay? Okay, next topic. Any questions about seashells or shorebirds? Great, let's talk about manatees, because I love them. I love them so much, you guys. Um, manatees are technically mammals. They are a marine mammal. Um, they are more, most closely related to uh, and descended from animals like elephants and hyraxes. So we talked about whales already and how whales are marine mammals that don't have back legs. Their front legs are modified into flippers. Same with these guys, but they evolved completely separately from whales and dolphins. Whales and dolphins are descended of um, arteriodactyly, which are, um, they're like deer, <laughs> like carnivorous deer, was a whale's uh, ancestor 60 million years ago. And then these guys, a little bit different, but the same general body design, because that's what evolution does. It perfects a body to its environment. So there are four species of um, these animals, of serenians. There are three species of manatee, and there's one species of dugong. Okay, so let's talk about them a little bit. So they have front flippers, but no rear, no rear limbs. Long day. And they have a paddle-like horizontal tail. Again, a lot like whales, okay? Manatees have a big, flat, rounded, paddly tail. Dugong's tail actually looks more like a dolphin's tail because they are they live in a little deeper water. They have to contend a little more with swimming in, in pelagic close pelagic zones, close to the shore. So they've got a little more hydrodynamic shape to their flukes. Um, these guys are herbivores. Most of them eat sea grasses and algaes. Um, manatees, whew, they get big. Don't let it, don't let the little cute boopy schnoots fool you because they're huge animals. And being so large, they don't have any natural predators. Um, again, but however, all four species of manatee and dugong are uh, threatened, endangered, um, particularly the dugong. And, and I will link these videos under this video for you to watch. 
Um, they, they don't, they don't have natural predators, but they are very susceptible to boat strikes. They get hit by boats. Nearly every manatee, especially the West Indian manatees that, um, that travel around the Caribbean, around Florida, Gulf of Mexico, um, they, they get run over and all of them have scars on their backs. You almost cannot find an unscarred manatee, like I said, even the babies, um, because they're, they, they don't, they're not fast and they're hard to see because they just hang out just below the surface. And when they breathe, they don't spout like a whale. So you can't see where they are from a distance. Um, and a boat going too fast will just run right over them and, and they get caught up by their props. Okay. So in, in manatee areas, there, there are some regulations in place to try to mitigate that. But again, big dumb animals with no predators. So they don't get out of the way and they, they reproduce really slowly. They're very slow animals. Their food is not very nutrient dense. And that's all in this manatee video, which I will also link. Okay. You can watch, you can watch Hank describe it because Hank of SciShow is, is awesome. Okay. These guys are herbivores. Again, they eat sea grasses and sea grass. Um, there's one particular kind of sea grass called manatee grass uh, that grow off of sandy shore coasts. And let's talk a little bit about some plants. So sea grasses are not very common. There are not very many species of vascular plant that can grow in salt water. They, they, they don't do well with salinity or salinity change, especially, or with if they're, if they're close to the shore, if there's any tidal changes that would expose them to the air, they don't do very well with that. So they generally are in very shallow, warmer waters. There are, um, seagrass beds that you can come sometimes see off of warmer, uh, sandy shore sandy shore areas. And again, these are true flowering plants. They are true grasses. They have roots, they have stems, they have leaves, they have flowers. Uh, this group of plants is also called angiosperms. They have um, xylem and phloem conducting tissues, uh, which is different from the, from the, from algae, which we're also going to talk about. I don't know when. Maybe that'll be our next unit. We'll talk about kelp. Uh, there are 250,000 species of vascular plant. Look out your window. You're sick with vascular plants. I've got four or five of them in the window here. But the the um, the marine grasses are not very diverse. There are these are the most common. There's manatee grass, which is very long, thin. Um, leaves are kind of cylindrical. And then there's also eel grass, paddle grass, turtle grass, and then surf grass is more of a rocky shore grass. It, it attaches to rocks and it's, it, it does better going between water and air. I'm going to take a sip of water because mm -hmm. I also get it. Okay. And, uh, seagrass meadows are threatened also by algae blooms and algae blooms are fueled by, remember, Yes, when we talked about phytoplankton, we talked about um, toxic algae blooms that are fueled by runoff from agricultural areas, too much fertilizer in the water. Um, so that fertilizer can also kind of spur on some growth of, of the grasses, but they are outcompeted and smothered by the algae. And then they're almost inedible and they, they don't do very well. The assignment that you have for today talks a little bit more about how manatees and seagrass beds interact and how manatees um, it looks like they overgraze, but then they actually make those seagrass meadows even better. Okay? And there's, there's a video about seagrasses. Um, I don't know if I'll link that one. Let me see. Okay. Uh, for able show and tell, when I was in the Caribbean, I went to Belize and Belize has beautiful, huge, um, seagrass beds that are just off of the shore between the shore and the coral reef. They've got the barrier reef. The Caribbean barrier reef is there. In between there are these, these wonderful seagrass meadows. And, um, I was lucky enough to be able to snorkel in there. And, and this stingray, I followed her around for a while and she was, she was this big, huge, watched her eat. And these seagrass beds provide a really important um, ecosystem. They're the primary producer in a meadow grass or a, a seagrass meadow ecosystem off of the sandy shore. So they provide shelter for a lot of crustaceans and um, things like leafy sea dragons, weedy sea dragons, seahorses, a lot of fish, this fish right here. I know you can't see it very well, but if you Google scrawled cowfish, S-C-R-A-W-L-E-D, or even just 
Google cowfish image, holy cow, they're so cute and they're so rare. And I was really lucky to get to see this little guy and he didn't even swim away. He was, he was pretending that I didn't see him. But this, this whole ecosystem just off the sandy shore is integral to helping support the invertebrates and the fish that live in the sandy shore ecosystem. And again, also, we wouldn't have manatees if we didn't have those grasses. Right? Uh, one more important sandy shore plant uh, are the mangroves. Mangrove forest is a whole ecosystem in and of itself, and they're usually adjacent to or associated with some sandy shores. Um, this is a tree that can tolerate salt water. They're found all over the world. And they, they again, they, they provide a really important shelter area for uh, both terrestrial and aquatic animals. Um, and they also help filter the water. They clean toxins out of the water and out of the air as well. And they also provide a physical barrier for storm surge. When there are hurricanes or um, crazy king tides, that water is kind of the energy of the water is, is buffered by the presence of these amazing trees and they have really um, intricate root and really strong root systems. So they're a very important, very important plant. And again, when I was in Belize, I was, it, it, the mangroves are just beautiful and full of so many birds and animals. And this is a canal that was dug by the Maya a thousand years ago. And it is the, in the border between Belize and Mexico. So these mangroves over here, they're in Belize. These mangroves over here, those are in Mexico. So uh, this is also a place uh, where manatees hang out quite a bit. I did not see any manatees. I've never seen a manatee, and it it makes me sad. I've been I've been to Florida in a river, and I've been to Belize in a river. No manatees. Hopefully someday free will we'll see a manatee. All right, I think. That's your assignment for today is to read the article on manatees and seagrasses. Read that and then fill in the article evaluation form. Please fill it in thoughtfully, thoroughly, completely. All of those things. Okay? And then on Wednesday, for you online students, I will post the instructions on Wednesday. If you can come to school, I recommend it just because I'll have all of the supplies that you need to do this. You are going to build a beach. You're going to build a beach in a box. And uh, you will need to know and be able to include these items, these uh, features from the beach uh, in your box without using notes. Yeah, I trust you at home. You bet. So you need to know what the foreshore is, backshore, slash zone. You need to know where the dunes and beach grasses are. And beach grasses, remember, are different from the sea grasses. I want you to be able to represent and know what the rack line is. And then, um, you know, I'm going to throw some animals at you. Make a shorebird, maybe, a crustacean, mollusk shells, and where you might find sea grasses and manatees. Okay. All right. I have boxes. If you have a box, bring it. I don't know how many boxes I have. Teachers have been bringing me their shoe boxes because that's what we do. Teachers are awesome. I don't know if you knew that. They're great. I work with a really good faculty. All right. That's it for me. I'll stop talking now because this has been really long and I'm really sorry, but I do love me a beach. So let's go to the beach, shall we? Okay. Have a great day. Be good. Be kind. Be safe. Bye.